G'day everyone, thanks for joining me today. And uh, today I've got a very interesting guest. She's a consultant in the startup world, a columnist for Business WA, uh, or Business News, sorry, and an entrepreneur uh, through and through. Chloe Constantinides, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. And, um, and really, you know, today the conversation is, is about yourself and uh, about the startup community in, in WA. I really, I, I want to kick off things with something, um, something a bit more fun, something that will help our listeners get to know you a little bit. Um, and it's just like a quick fire sort of question, um, you know, alternatives you'll pick, would you rather X, Y, Z? Sure. Um, Sounds fun. <laughs> so, so yeah, and then we, we can discuss it a little bit as well. So, so the first one I have is, would you rather be alone on an island for the rest of your life or be with someone you really hate for the rest of your life on that same island? <laughs> I think be with someone I hate. Okay. This is an interesting one because most people do choose that option. Yeah. Um, Maybe, yeah, I, I think I would opt for that as well, just for the practicality of sometimes you just need support. You need someone around if you're sick or maybe you need someone to help you carry the, the wood or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think what's the point if there's no one else? <laughs> I don't know. Or, you know, you can work together or there might be good qualities in that person that you actually hate. So, Valid. Very valid. <laughs> And I think that's what most people do come towards. Initially, my original gut feeling is not just leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy by myself. Uh, but all right, we'll I go. I do like alone time, but not that much. Not the so. rest of your life. Um, so the next question: Would you rather inherit twenty million dollars or earn fifty million dollars through hard work? Earn fifty through hard work. Okay. Talk us through that. <laughs> um, I think I have a benchmark of a personal kind of reach of how much I want to earn for multiple reasons, for, for lifestyle and enjoyment and that kind of stuff, but also because I have an idea of what I want to do in the world and, and the type of money that I would need to do that. $20 million wouldn't cover it, okay. um, which is one thing. And also I... I well, it's nice to, if someone gave you $20 million. I don't think it would feel good. I don't think yeah. it would feel um, as rewarding and as, and as enriching if you earn to yourself. So, Okay. Yeah, I think, I think there's two schools of thought there. Mm -hmm. And one is, like you said, yeah, earning it is, one, more sustainable because you can kind of roll that forward and you have something set up to continue that business. Um, if you just inherited it, you could easily spend it just as quickly and not maybe, I don't know. That, that, that's, that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is if you started with $20 million, you, you can grow it. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so it, it, Which is a very good point. And, yeah, potentially, like if I had $20 million, $20 million right now, what could you do with that? And there's a lot you could do. So as a baseline... If you started with 20, fantastic. If it's that you're ending up with 20, you're ending up with 50. Yeah. Um, Obviously, you want to end up with the more. Yeah. More. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good perspective. And the last one is, would you prefer to either have free Wi-Fi wherever you go mm -hmm. or, and full connection, um, or unlimited tea or coffee at any cafe worldwide? <laughs> so free Wi-Fi or free tea or coffee worldwide, just for you. I feel like free Wi-Fi kind of already exists. Yeah. I don't really know many places where you can't access some form of free Wi-Fi or piggyback of yeah. someone's free Wi-Fi, so I probably opt for the free coffee. Free tea or coffee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I'm in the same boat there. Right, awesome. So now, now that we've really got to know you a little bit, maybe you can tell us and, and the listeners as well a little bit about your background, um, your journey so far, and, and you know what you're doing currently. Sure. Um, my life and my journey, my career has always been a very mixed bag. So uh, I currently I call myself sort of an innovation consultant, um, and I work with 
enterprise and startups across various industries. Um, it started, I guess, when I left high school. I actually applied for architecture at UW and I got in and I decided I'd take a year off and go traveling. And um, I, I didn't end up going into architecture. Someone said it was five years of really hard work. And um, at the time, I was enjoying yeah, sure. <laughs> having fun and stuff. So I, yeah, took the year off. Um, I did lots of random jobs. I worked for Cirque du Soleil. I, um, I've done everything under the sun. It's, it's not even funny. Um, and then I came back, went to uni, and I did marketing and advertising. Um, actually started in business and then switched over to a comms yeah. degree. Uh, that was awesome. I worked full time through uh, most of my uni life. So even, um, yeah. During, I did two degrees. The first one worked almost full time, almost the whole time. Um, and that was in ad agencies, in marketing roles, and that kind of stuff. Um, I did an internship in New York. So I went and did an internship working on a campaign for the UN. Um, wow. That was really cool. I got to work with all these incredible people there and all like the big ad, ad guns of the world. And um, yeah, so I learned a lot in that space. and. I guess got really excited by that. Came home, worked in a tech, like an electronics engineering company uh, in a marketing role. However, it was a very small team. So I was sitting and working with electronics engineers all day and we'd be talking about capacitors and resistors and, sure. um, you know, um, creating technology. And it was something I'd grown up with tech and all that kind of stuff and always had an interest in it. But this was a deep heavy. dive, <laughs> yeah. sure. very heavy technical electronics based stuff. Um, we were building black boxes. Uh, we called it Uber before Uber was a thing. So we sold off some products and that type of thing. So it kind of got me thinking into, I guess that entrepreneurial stuff, creating new things, coming up with new ideas, um, and also about lean thinking and um, doing lean business. Because when I got in there, they had these wild ideas and they were huge and they had you know, iris sensors and weather sensors and all this kind of stuff. And um, I came in and tried to strip it back to a marketable, affordable product that people could actually buy. Um, so learning a lot of things on the fly like that sure. um, and manufacturing as well. So I had to, you know, deal with ordering from the US and China and other places as well. It, Evolved from there, I um, I did other studies along the way, I went back to uni, I did a degree in um, creative industries but focused on tech and coding and that type of thing. Okay. Um, so let, let me pause you there yeah. on that. that that's, a, that's an interesting one. Uh, how did you even find out about this course in creative industries? Uh, I was hunting, so... A little bit back from that, I wanted to um, go to Paris for my, my cousin's wedding and I wanted money to do it and I thought it would be a great idea to start an events company <laughs> and make some money and pay for my trip. And um, in doing that, I had to pay for someone to build a website for me and it really frustrated me um, how much I had to pay and how long it took and that I couldn't just have an idea and spin it up. So. I was like, I want to be able to make my own websites and I want to be able to make my own apps. Um, yeah. And that was the main motivation. And I hunted for whatever courses were available to let me do that. Okay. Um, and this course seemed to be the most diverse. It allowed me to do 3D design and animation and um, videography, photography, um, you know, graphic design and then coding as well. Wow. So. Um, it was a good mix of just tools that I thought yep. would be useful um, and they've proved to be since, so yeah. Okay. So, so that, that's an interesting, I mean, an interesting concept, creativity. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about that on, on a recent episode um, with, with, with a previous guest on, and he, he kind of, he's very big on teaching creativity and creativity is something that can be nurtured. Uh, and you can be taught to be more creative. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's your creative process? Do you have any 
any uh, examples or, or you know key things that help you be creative or key practices or um i i agree that it can be nurtured i think there's definitely a mix of some people are born with that kind of personality that sure. they just thrive and that stuff um but it can definitely be learnt and fostered um i don't know about processes specifically because process in itself almost it goes against creative. yeah yeah, yeah. I think it's where you feel most comfortable is when you get most creative. So, like, I, I really love music, um, all different sorts and that kind of stuff. So if, if I find all my favourite songs or discover new songs and just play a playlist really loud and <laughs> um, I love, like, painting and drawing and all that kind of stuff, which is stereotypically creative, but um, I do find those sorts of things to be almost mindless tasks that allow you, your brain to switch off in a sense, Sure, I think allows, gives you space to feel creative or to think okay. creatively. Okay, interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there's, there's, a, there's a school of thought where you've got a, you got a your product of your environment yeah. to create a, a sort of creative or conducive to creative environment. Mm -hmm. that, can, that can definitely, I think that's, that can help. Um, I think, uh, sorry to cut you off. I think clutter and stress and, um, you know, the daily grind can get in the way of creativity. So yeah, removing yourself in some way, stepping out or finding a way that you can switch off, I think is okay. important. All right. Uh, so so you've you've found yourself in in this kind of tech creative world. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you explain a bit about what you're doing currently? I mean, I know you just uh, wrapped up some stuff with UWA and Curtin. Yeah. Let me talk us through through a bit of that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I shifted into tech and app development and I was in mobile apps for about five years. Um, I still build or help build digital products for people. Um, so that's part of what I do. And then I consult to companies, um, yeah, startups, across marketing growth, creative, I guess, so design, that sort of thing. Um, but it's more about the mindset and the entrepreneurial mindset and how to um, build businesses from the ground up and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, which is what we were doing through Curtin Accelerate. So we were taking um, ideas and accelerating them or, or growing them to that next level. Um, and UWA's IQX uh, was a program, so it's IQX Academy. Um, and that was all about teaching people these tools and mindsets that are, are really, um, you know, no, no disrespect to universities, but universities struggle to keep up with and struggle to teach, I guess. So they're bringing in these additional um, platforms or additional channels for students to learn these new ways of thinking, new ways of doing business. Oh, that's interesting. Because it is a different world. Yeah, of course. You know. And they're va valuable skills. You yeah, know, you need yeah. Them. So it's nice to see um, them recognising that and offering that to students. I think it's great. Excellent. And is that something that you can do as a unit or something like that? Or is it a course that was an extra cur curricular sort of thing? It's an extra curricular thing, those two particular things. So um, Accelerate is for... Um, I th it was students, staff, researchers. It included anyone in that sure. in that range, whereas UWA was focused more on um, you know undergrads. Um, but there are channels. I know you know Bloom has their um, course, yeah. their course where they allow credit towards university and stuff. So there's a lot happening and a lot um, changing. That's yeah, it's nice to see. One question that I did have for you is looking at the startups that are coming through in WA, what are the key considerations or key focus things that should be on every startup's mind, every startup's strategic plan? What are the fundamentals that they must get right if they want to grow? Good question. Um, I think product market fit is a big thing. Like, Number one, and this was drilled into us in marketing and advertising, you know, getting to understand your customers and is this something they actually want? So 
And my dad's always said this to me. He said everything should be 80% research and 20% execution. And sure. you'll always execute better if you're well-informed, well-educated, yep. understand your market, all that kind of stuff. So there are anomalies that don't kind of fit that. You know, there's freakish things like Twitter, which I think is an absolutely ridiculous concept, which I hate, <laughs> but it's so successful. Um, so sometimes that doesn't work, um, but it is really, really important to consistently refer to your customers, consistently talk to them, ask for feedback, um, don't assume you know everything, um, and yeah, keep being hungry and curious and persistent, I think, yeah. is the biggest thing. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's really valid. You need to be selling something that people want. Yeah. There's no way. Um, there's no way to grow otherwise. Yeah. I mean, another guest of ours, we were talking about, you know, raising capital and raising raising funds to get your ideas off the ground. Mm -hmm. How do how does you know regular Joe who's got an idea who works nine to five in his spare time? He's putting together a plan, but you know he's got he doesn't have the savings. He doesn't have anything. How do, how do you go about getting funding? There's I mean, there's numerous channels. Um, so there's obviously bootstrapping. The ideal scenario is that you can get customers to pay for something or, you know, pre-order or that kind of thing. Like that's that's the ultimate. Um, then there's obviously there's some great things through Kickstarter and crowdfunding sure. things. There's equity crowdfunding now. Um, then you've got sort of your your angel investors, so you've got early stage investors, and then you've got um, venture capitalists as well. Yeah. Um, there's not a huge amount. There's a lot of um, programs and competitions as well, so people can enter yeah, these competitions okay. and earn money or pitch to investors. Um, and a, a Google search or, you know, also will, might show some of those up. Um, in terms of pitching to real investors or VCs, um, having a really solid pitch deck and again, being really, really sure on your numbers, on how it's going to work, on your research, validating your concept, validating your idea, all that kind of stuff is really important. Yeah. Um, and everyone's seen those, you know, Shark Tank and Dragon's Den type shows and that's essentially what a pitch would consist of. Um, but more and more you hear people saying that they invest in the people rather than the ideas. So it's... I think it's really important to um, employ that that mindset and to be open and willing to learn and willing to receive feedback always. Um, but yeah, in terms of securing funding, I think getting investors in early, getting advisors, so hit up people that you respect or that you think might strategically um, be aligned with your business or your goals. Sure and saying like, hey, I have this idea, it's really early stage, but I'd love to chat about it. I'd love to get your feedback. Um, and, you know, when you are ready to raise capital, then you can say to them, hey, this is where it's at. Um, here's our pitch deck. If you know anyone that might be interested or, um, yeah, you can, okay. I think building relationships early sure. and spreading the net wide is good. Okay. In the WA and Australian market, do we do you find much international investment? Do you find, or do you find homegrown sort of private equity? I think there's there's a lot of private equity. I think there's a lot of untapped private equity in Perth. Um, I hear from you know just average business people that say, oh, I'd love to invest in startups and stuff, but they don't know where to look, um, and startups don't on the other side don't know how to find those funds. Sure. Um, I've seen a few examples, you know, so Sequoia investing in Health Engine, um, they're a big name and if you can get Sequoia interested in your startup, that's fantastic. Um, and I've seen a few startups in Perth um, get interest from those types of firms. Um, so it does happen, but sure. it's not common, I would sure. say. Um, a company that I was working with or doing, still doing some work with um, functionally we raised a mix of Australian and, and US investors, um, but they had strong networks 
okay. in the US already, and half of our team are in the US. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's not common, but it does happen. I'm a complete outsider to this yeah, you know, environment, so <laughs> this is just helping me shape this picture, and I hope the audience as well. Mm -hmm. Now, one question I had, moving to you know, successful startups and, and, and growing rapidly, where have you seen most startups fail? Or, you know, what are some spectacular fails, without naming names, obviously, <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is all learning for everyone out there, right? Yeah. We can try and apply some of these lessons learned. And it doesn't have to be Australian, it can be work, it can be, you know, all over the world. Anywhere. Um, gosh, I think there's, a, there's obviously countless ways you can fail. I, um, one that comes up time and time again, it's not like a spectacular fail, but it's just something that people do, is they're very overprotective of their idea. And they think that their idea is one that everyone wants to steal and therefore they wrap it up in bubble wrap and put it in a box and yeah. um, refuse to tell anyone about it. But in doing so, that's to their detriment because um, they're not getting it out there. I find the opposite works. Like the more people you talk to, the more you get feedback, the better yeah. and richer and stronger your idea will be. So that's one way, um, poor understanding of the market or not validating concepts beforehand. That happens all the time um, and you see it all the time and you see quite advanced products or quite advanced companies that you know might be turning over a few million dollars a year that are refusing to listen to their customers and you know you can, you can almost foresee the end of that business because they're just not prepared to listen um, and it's they might keep ticking over for a while but eventually they'll come undone because of it unless something changes okay so um, stay humble yeah yeah just that feedback loop that validation is just critical and i think the other thing is you see a lot of founders that get together and as I say, you know, it's, it's like a marriage, you'll spend more time with these people than you probably will with your family at times. And you've got to pick the right people to work with. Um, it is a relationship. It's something that's give and take and you've got to work in complementary ways. So yeah, finding the right people and building a good team is really challenging um, and something a lot of companies fail to do well. Thanks for listening to the first half of this podcast. Keep an eye out for the second half coming soon.